So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, community webinar. Absolutely delighted you could join us once again uh, on this monthly event that we do. Uh, always good to have people. I was only trying to adjust the screen in the background all of a sudden. There we are. Um, always good to have uh, everyone who joins us live. But of course, one of the main reasons we do these is to record uh, the content. A lot of people listen into the recording and, and then we put out shorts uh, on our social media with the most um, interesting and beneficial and viable comments that are made on our community webinar. So for those that don't know me, my name is David Johnson and I'm the CBO of Prop Funders. Uh, we'll mention a little bit more about us at the very end. But when we do these community webinars, it's less about us and more about the guests that we have on. Um, so a bit of housekeeping, we don't do anything in the chat box. So please um, put any questions you have directly into the Q&A and we'll be able then to uh, deal with the questions as we as we go along. So before we get into the, the main itinerary, let me say a quick hello to um, Lars and Todd. So Lars, first of all, how are you, my friend, today? Not too bad, but uh, very, very happy though. I've got a sunny day. It's all good. Good, good, good. Enjoy every sunny day in October you get because uh, mm. there may not be too many more for a wee while. <laughs> very true, very true. Good. Thanks much for coming on. Appreciate that. And uh, Todd Walker, our resident um, marketing expert. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you, David. Thanks for having us on. And it's a pleasure to be sharing a webinar with Lars. No problem at all. Fantastic. So there we are. We're all uh, the love has been shared around all the guests straight away before we start. That's brilliant. <laughs> Always like that. So listen, let's get, get straight into it. Um, for anyone who happens to be on um, for the first time, uh, this is very much um, geared around funding for property deals and, of course, related to that, um, our investors into property. Um, so we bring content and guests that are, are very relevant to, to that overarching topic. But, of course, the tentacles of that go sort of wide and deep uh, into all aspects of property. So today, um, what we have um, focusing on is unlocking uh, SaaS pensions, particularly for property projects. Um, so it's going to be a really, really um, interesting session, which we'll come to in a minute. But before that, we're going to, as usual, kick off with a little bit of um, information just about us. First of all, mission statement. Always like to mention this keeps us on 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 track. Uh, we empower SME property developers to build more homes by disrupting the alternative funding market. So that's what we're about. That's what gets us out of bed in the morning. That's what motivates us. Uh, and that's what these... Uh, webinars are all about. So first of all, uh, Todd Walker, who uh, does some work for Prop Funders as a consultant, uh, runs Villator Media, uh, always like sort of to, to kick off these with a few tips uh, regarding marketing and social media. Um, so Todd, you're very welcome. Um, set the clock here at about three and a half minutes. Uh, I know you're brilliant at getting through information. So uh, over to you and uh, you can just give me a nod when you want the, the slides changed. Cool. Let's go. <laughs> right so uh one thing people like to do obviously in property is well we we need to do the bare minimum for our social media to make sure that we can get marketing out there and i'm trying to basically try to put like a really quick short powerpoint together so you guys can you know if at the worst case if you can at least do this it's at least you're doing something and and it might help give you some tips on, on what to do so you can go into the next slide please david so one thing that i've so i've just to start a project my own a couple of weeks ago and i wanted to just uh, because obviously doing lots of stuff need, need need lots of people need lots of help i wanted to be able to at least do the bare minimum on the project to make sure it's getting marketed right and that people understand what's going on and from that i came to the conclusion that of making at least of a weekly vlog of the project is like at least some, something important it's nothing daily but obviously if you're on site daily and you can get little snippets and stuff it's not often enough to make an, a long video but at least it's a long you can put it all together at the end of that seven days and you can actually see a significant amount of progress. So if we go on to the next slide, please, David. So how can you do this? Super simple. Everyone has a phone. If you have a camera, great, but it's not important. I record everything that I do on my iPhone and can set up people on time lapses, wide angles or things like that. And it's just perfect for what is there. And what you can do when you're on site, when using your 
camera to film your projects you've gone on there you've done for a site visit you're going to check everyone seeing how the progress is going we're trying to sort something out record people getting stuff done working five to ten minutes of just people cracking on you know first fix might be happening or rip out might be happening get people destroying stuff get people you know installing the new bits and bobs high level conversations with you and your project manager or you and your builders to try and figure out where things are going just show people what you're doing and how you're managing that because that is a really good insight and it's just five to ten minutes of you recording a conversation and that's it and stuff in there will be valuable to people watching giving progress updates so obviously seeing how you've gotten through from step one to step two or step four to step five however you you know whatever stage you're at give a progress update short and sweet this is what it's cost us this is how we've got around this problem this problem and this problem and just show that when you're on site so this is you know this is where we had here this is where we had there and you know that sort of stuff and then just keeping your content organized just put it in a folder day one day two day three day four day five day six day seven and then you've got your week set out and if you can just sort that out it takes five to ten minutes you know to go on site to record it and then to upload it you know either to a google drive via 4g or if you have wi-fi at your site great but just takes that and it is just having that sort of that yeah what you do is what you get and obviously the more you do the more you're going to get but at least if you're doing that you're getting sort of the bare minimum which means you can then you know capture and document your project as it goes along next slide please david so uh what will this do for you you know basically just documenting the stuff is going to keep you there that's me and my little project it's a little flat um just filming just like a little walkthrough of the, the weekend of how, how we got on and depending on your avatars will depend on different ways that you can address them with that so potential investors will be able to see your you know that you're actively working on site and that you're actively you know getting stuff done and you're making use of the money that they provided just capital your team will be able to show off or well, one you can sh show that you've got a team and that you're actually you know have a group of people around you because often you know you don't want to just be relying on one person you'll be relying on a group of people and making sure that everyone is doing each part and if you're showing each person doing their part and what they're doing then you know you're more likely to build trust with those people and obviously on social media it's just going to help you with build a following and get people to know that hey like this guy actually says he he's good at what he does and then maybe a few months down the line someone else is starting something similar and they can come and ask you for questions or advice and you know it'll just help you with that and the more people that know about what you're doing the easier it's going to be to find investors and the easier it's going to be to build a better and bigger team because they can see one you know how you treat your staff from these documents and you know how, how you manage your building sites or projects next slide please um so just three simple tips to basically get this done to make it super easy for you the best way to make a you know something that you've got to do that you don't like doing easy to do is just to make it really obvious um via sort of you know if you haven't read atomic habits read that because that is the best thing to help you sort of just set up something new if you haven't already started um but leave a note on site wall so as soon as you get on site whatever the first part of the property you know if you're walking through a front door if you're walking through a gate or you're walking through just leave a note on there says record 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 and likewise on the way out upload 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 wherever you record it Make sure you upload it. So on the way out, you see, oh, I should upload this. Oh, okay, quick. Let me do that before I leave the site. And you're just reminding, right, reminding yourself. Two, you can obviously hire someone that can come on site. You'd like you'd hire a chippy, an electrician, a plumber, hire a videographer or a video editor or someone that can come along and make that easy for you. So you know exactly as soon as you're on site, someone's going to be there filming you, getting capturing all the stuff that needs to be done. And obviously when they leave, they're reminded by the notes that you left to upload it and record it and X, Y, Z and obviously just add it to your to-do list just make it make it aware make it make it important that you're doing it and you know it's a task that needs to be done at the end of the day if you want to do it uh get it edited and get it out there so make sure your content is filmed get it edited and make sure it makes sense when posting and then finally actually post it on social media i know a lot of people don't post the stuff i reckon you guys everyone has stuff in their camera roll that they could be posting uh of stuff that they've done and they just haven't so you know even if it's a picture short video reel of someone doing something silly or you know or just you know something cool that you've done you know it might be a final progress picture and you're like damn this looks great just make sure you post it uh and this can be done in the forms of instagram stories short videos photo posts or a blog but make sure you actually do it and that is the most important thing i'd say take away to take out from this just do it uh, and if you need help with filming editing um reach out to me and uh, we can have a little chat
Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. And I think, um, Todd, from working with you the last year or so, what struck me about um, the way you operate and, and the way you would constantly scold me about my um, sometimes lack of putting things on social media is that nothing you talk about is rocket science. It's the discipline of doing the basics. And is that fair to say that's really what's key in building that social media profile? Yeah, the key is just getting stuff out there. You know, obviously, the better stuff you put out there, the more responses you're going to get, the better, you know, so if you can put some stuff into quality, then great, do it. But yeah, fundamentally, it is, I'd say, just get stuff out there, get get at least of what you're doing and like stuff that not necessarily everyone's going to be able to, you know, be able to do themselves. Because if you're doing something that's slightly different to people and they're like, you know, it sparks interest, conversations happen. And then people are like, oh, if you're posting every day that you're on site managing teams or you just bought a new property or you're always doing properties, they're going to be like, oh, he's probably doing something to do with property. <laughs> and then eventually you'll get better at it and, you know, go high level down, you know, it's still like, oh, this is an investor conversation. This is, a, you know, how we deal with our exit bridges. This is how we deal with our this, that, the other. So, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. And uh, uh, I think you're you're staying on to be part of the conversation around SASs. And uh, I know that's a conversation we have had in the past. So uh, you can keep an eye on the on the questions for me as well. So let's get straight on to our special guest today, uh, Mr. Lars Singleton. Uh, the topic um, that we've gone for today is this unlocking uh, SAS pensions for property. Uh, it's a big, big topic. And it's one of those topics that people maybe have an opinion on, but maybe don't have the expertise. Uh, and therefore, sometimes people shy away from it because they're not entirely sure. Uh, when someone hears the word pensions, sharp intake of breath, uh, because they're immediately thinking of regulations and all that goes with that. Um, so today is about unpacking all of that, taking away the mystery of it. And nobody better, and I mean that, nobody better in the UK that I'd want to have on this than Mr. Lars Singleton. Um, so Lars, absolutely delighted to have you here today. You're on mute, I think, currently. Unless I've somehow muted you from uh, Master Copy. That, there you are. No, that that was me. Sorry, I'm I'm actually in the office at the moment, so I was sort of putting it on mute. So apologies. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you. Thanks, David. Yeah, and uh, I I know you're not a man that likes to sort of blow your own trumpet too too loudly. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to give you the intro <laughs> to give you this very kind to, to give you the big one. So I know obviously you're, you're chairman of the empowered group, um, which is a lot of exciting things happening with that. And we will be mentioning, um, a, a major event that you have, uh, next, um, Friday in London, um, mm -hmm. obviously mines and director of the empowered pensions, part of that, uh, corporate trustee, uh, you obviously do your own investing. You might mention that as we go along in terms of, of property. Um, mm -hmm. But really, I think how you're best known and when you're on the circuit and invited to all the different events you're invited to, um, it's mainly because you're known as a, as a SaaS pension expert. Um, that word may get bandied about too often sometimes, but um, you know you obviously fit in that space. This is your passion. This is your, your life. Uh, and therefore, you've got a lot of really important takes on, on that whole um, SaaS arena. So uh, is that a fair enough introduction? Have I missed anything else? Have you climbed Mount Everest no, or anything that I'm aware of? Um, I, do, I, do, I do a bit of rock climbing, but uh, not not Everest. No, that's uh, that's one that's eluded me. And I, I think I'm a little old for, um, for that sort of uh, caper these days. So, but uh, no, no, that's a sort of fair assessment. Um, I mean, the group is, is now... I, yes, it is very uh, centric um, to to pensions, um, but we also now have a a, a funding business, a, a sort of an academy um, for um, for the investments and investment sort of uh, pros uh, processes, um, and and sort of quite a lot of sort of wider scope. But it at it, at its core, it is still very much a pensions business. Brilliant. That's me. Okay, so so um, what we <laughs> excuse me, what we normally do is we just come off screen now. And this is mm -hmm. more interactive. Um, mm -hmm. We'll go with some questions. So again, if anyone's got any questions, please put them into the um, the, the Q and A, uh, and then we can deal them as we go along. Maybe two or three questions similar that we can we can you know, group together. Um, but any questions you have, get them in the Q and A, and we'll be delighted to, to deal with them and put them and put them to large. So let's just come off um, screen. And of course, if you have any shared screen you want to do Lars just shout and, and give you controls if you want to if you have any slides you want to show that help um, what you're saying well I, I 
I wonder whether I've got a I've got a one slide. I, I wonder whether I should do a, just a sort of a, a quick rundown of you know what is a SaaS, just in case um, folks are um, uh, wondering what this thing is. Yeah, definitely. That's maybe a good place to start. That was the first question I was going to ask you: is what <laughs> is a SaaS pension? So, if you have a slide, then one hundred percent, you should have screens okay, there. So can... Let me um, do I sh I share through the green button? Hopefully. Uh... Okay, so you should you should be seeing just the one page. Um, I I am not one for uh, for graphics and uh, and the like. So um, one of one of my sort of I suppose uh, one one of my part of my brands is it's, it is very much uh, me and um, and the word. It's um, it's something that I've been doing now for for thirty odd years. Um, this this. Uh, Thing called a SaaS. It is a small self-administered scheme. Uh, what, what does it do? What is it? Um, it is a type of company pension scheme. It's, it's very, very simple. It's uh, You've got a number of different pension types in, in this country. Uh, most people will be very familiar with their personal pension. This is a one-person thing that you buy from uh, an insurance company. You put your £100 or £200 a month into it. Um, and you and you pick from the investments that that particular company wants to put in front of you. Now, the business of Standard Life and um, Legal and General and these these companies is to manage money. Um, the wrapper um, that they put that investment into is uh, is either a, a pension or an ISA or that sort of thing. Um, so, a personal pension is is a one person wrapper that uh, that you know you will buy from an insurance company what this thing is is very much like um when you started in your corporate life and they showed you where the uh, the coffee machine was they told you what your salary was they said would you like to join the company pension scheme you say mm, okay that's interesting um and this this is one of those it is a small version um the hmrc allow you to to have um, if you joined a, a large corporate, you would have the large version. Why is this um, a small one? Well, because it has only up to 11 people in it. Now, usually um, for for my purposes, we, we would be talking to small and medium-sized companies. They would have two, possibly three people that go into it. Um, now, what it does is it allows um, those uh, people who are – you know, sort of the, the controllers of the business to do a lot more than you would be able to do with your standard life or your legal and general pension. That's not to detract from, from what you can do with those companies. But there is a big list of investments, and it's not just about one company's investment funds. Um, there is So there is no provider. There is no big insurance company. You are going direct to HMRC. Um, it is set up under trust, and therefore the trustees, which you will be, um, are responsible for complying with the rules of HMRC. So all of a sudden, you suddenly you become uh, both the, the power um, behind the, the the running of your own company pension scheme, but also responsible for, to HMRC to make sure that it stays within the rules. Now, to help you stay within the rules, you have um, something called a scheme administrator and an independent or corporate trustee. Now, those people are there, and in the case of the scheme administrator, they're there to, to keep the, the records, keep the books, make sure the assets and the, the register and the accounting is all done per HMRC's requirements. The trustee, the corporate trustee, um, helps you um, make good decisions. Now, the, it could be limited to just telling you, you know, which um, items are within HMRC's rules and which, H which investments are not. Um, or it could be the full-blown um, uh, trustee service where they actually help you with, with um, you know, choosing those investments, doing the research, doing the due diligence. If it's the former, if they're just telling you about compliance, it is your job to find the thing. And that's what makes it exciting because there is no one between you and the decision whether to invest or not. Now, that obviously means that you have to be competent in that area. Um, and you know where where it works really really well. People are experts, and they they apply their expertise to their investment choice. Where it doesn't work well, um, do things that uh, that maybe they're not that uh, familiar with or not um, competent in in that particular area. So is very much there are no safety nets in in terms of um, you know can you blame someone else? No, because you are the decision maker in in this this particular instance.
uh the the you know the key here is that you're making investments and um you don't have to pay um uh, taxes on those investments so literally it is tax free any contribution that you put in by you know via your own um, resources or from your company um, will be free of the the tax that would be applied so if it's either income tax relief or corporation tax relief and all the money that goes into it will grow free of all taxes now that includes inheritance tax as well. So because it's in, in a trust, it is immediately outside of your estate. So in the event of your death, it goes to your next of kin or whoever you want to pass it on to, no inheritance tax to pay. Now, I've left in here um, a reference to what used to be called the lifetime allowance, um, which was there is a limitation to HMRC's general. I think we lost Lars. <laughs> oh, okay. That was uh let's put on his way back in again now. Okay, dropped out there, David. Yeah, that's okay. You're David, back in now. Uh, yes. Okay. okay. Sorry, David, I, I think I dropped out there. My uh That's okay, you can go back to the obviously appears to be a little bit on the dicey side. So let me go back to uh, uh hopefully um, right. So there used to be this thing called the lifetime allowance, which is why we've got, got this this figure of a million seventy three thousand. Uh, now that is that no longer applies, um, but because we've got a change of government, because they're sort of working out what they're going to be doing uh, with the pension rules, I've left it in here because it still applies when you're looking at the, some of the benefits you can take from this pension scheme. So don't worry too much about that million seventy three thousand pounds. It is per person in in the scheme. Uh, it does affect in some some areas, but. As I say, full tax relief, that's what this thing's all about. It's not paying tax um, on the money you make. So your company makes money, puts it in. Thank you, Frozen, again, uh, Lars. Technology, technology. Are you ready to step in, Todd, and do a whole presentation on SASs? Yeah, I've done my SAS um, qualification thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't think I could step in, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, there's lots no, of questions sure. coming in, so. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, are back again. I was just, I was uh, just asking Todd uh, how he was on the SaaS presentations. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. <laughs> Go again. Um, with a bit of luck, we've got um, some Wi-Fi here. I'm not quite sure why today it's decided. Maybe it's just that law. Um, so um, trust-based pension outside of your estate and um, free from, from creditors. So it's very, very um, sort of beneficial. It sort of protects the wealth. It sort of seal, seals that, um, that benefit to you. And with a bit of luck, it is not an, it's not a, a retail investment product. It's, it's not like your personal pension or your ISA. It's not regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, but it is regulated by the pensions regulator. So it's, not that it's not regulated, just regulated by a different party. Um, obviously, we've got to comply with HMRC's rules. Um, there is an ombudsman. There may be a link back to um, the financial ombudsman service if you're investing in uh, uh, um, in things that are regulated by the FCA. So that that really is, you know, what is a what is a SAS? Um, questions on that. Yeah, so anything Todd come in specifically on that? I suppose one question yeah. I would have that would lead out of that would be um, how does this differ from SIPs? I know when I was involved in property yeah. sort of 10, 15 years ago, that was the big the big vehicle people were trying to invest in property through. So what are the differences in that? Well, the, the differences are that the, the a SIP is a self-invested 
personal pension. So the, um, as I mentioned, personal pensions you, is a sort of one person uh, arrangement. Um, a SAS is a scheme, which means it can have multiple people sort of, you know, joining forces to, uh, to, to make those investments. So it may be that you, you have a one person SAS, but, you know, it's open to, uh, to sort of life partners, to business partners, even, uh, you know, an entire family, and which gives you the opportunity to, to, to play with a sort of a larger sort of block of money. It also means, and this is one of the key reasons for a SaaS, is that um, you can actually, one of the things that you can do with it, which is the, the sort of second part of, you know, why, why SaaS, um, one of the things you can do with a SaaS is because you've got a company um, and because it's linked to that company, you can actually lend money from the pension scheme back into to your company. So if your company fixes fridges or builds houses or, you know, whatever it is, as long as you comply with HMRC's rules, you can use up to half of your pension, um, you know, in the furtherance, in the sort of the, the be your own bank type uh, environment. Um, yes, there are rules, but once you've complied with those rules, that loan can be used for whatever it is your company does, which sort of brings it back into funding for, for property. Yeah, and we'll probably um, unpack that a bit more in a few minutes. Uh, but Todd, mm -hmm. um, questions coming in there initially. Let's um, deal with those because it's important we get people a chance to get their questions answered. Yep. Yeah, yeah, of course. So uh, Keith Belgrave has asked, I've heard that Empower have stopped auto-invest with crowd property and other platforms. Uh, is Empower still allowing investments in crowd property type platforms? Uh, yes, we are. Um, the 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 issue with it's not it's not specifically crowd property. It's uh, in certain platforms you have a, an auto invest and auto reinvest facility. So you'll you'll start an account with them. You'll drop your um, you know the the money that you want to invest with with that particular platform, and then they will spread it over a number of different projects in a sort of an automated way. And then when you get to the end of that process, um, the money drops back into the uh, into the uh, platform's cash account, um, and they sort of go again, go again. It just sort of recycles the money, that sort of thing, which is brilliant. It's a great um, service, and you know we work very closely with Crown Property and, and other platforms that operate this way. However, when uh, we when we invest, um, we we are um, beholden to um, this pension regulator and to the pensions ombudsman service um, that uh, that deals with um, problems that have occurred in in our particular field. One of those um, one of the problems that has occurred is um, a, a case called Mr N versus Rowan Moore. Um, and in that particular case, um, both the the member trustees, the people that ran the pension scheme, the investors, and the uh, the the trustee, the professional trustee, were asked uh, were, were basically criticised for uh, not fulfilling certain responsibilities. Now, one of those responsibilities was to understand um, the HMRC compliance um, in these areas. Um, and with auto invest and auto reinvest, um, the, the the problem is that you're spread over uh, tens, if potentially hundreds, of different projects. Now, if we if we we have to give a compliance rating for every single project, so we have to know what that compliance rating is and what the what the project is um, before um, the money is actually deployed. So. Uh, Working with um, the platforms and, and very much especially with uh, crowd property, um, we, we're now getting a data feed from several, several platforms uh, where we can, uh, we, can re we can assess the compliance prior to the project going live. And then uh, in that situation, if it is compliant, we can say, OK, this one's good. But actually, no, we can't have clients invested in that, in that one over there. Um, so are we still working with crowd property? Very much so. Um, do we wish to um, put a switch back on the auto invest, auto reinvest? Answer very much yes. Um, uh, will we be doing it soon with crowd property? We expect so. Uh, we work closely with them. We expect that solution sort of fairly soon. Okay. Any other questions there? Uh... Yes. Yes. Oh. We've got, um, I have a very small pension pot, 20, K roughly and I'm wondering whether it would be worth me putting it into a SaaS to potentially invest in my property business okay 
Um, okay, so the the answer to that um, is is going to be as is as is always the case. It sounds like a politician's answer. It depends. Um, in that particular case where you've got twenty thousand um, pounds, it depends on what you want to, you actually want to invest in. So you can. Uh, you can invest towards um, uh, property such as through the the crowd uh, funding platforms such as crowd property and and the like. Um, where it comes to actually taking that particular twenty thousand pounds and investing it in a project, um, it it will be difficult to to see how you could get that into a project because it's a fairly modest um, pension. Um, and usually you would need um, you know a, a little bit more money to actually do a um, a, a property project with it um the 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 key here is is also um, looking at the um the value or the the cost benefit analysis of of a saas um most of the saas providers charge a flat fee for administration um and in that uh, that flat fee is usually something in the region of about fifteen hundred, maybe even two thousand pounds a year for that service. So, if you have a twenty thousand pound fund and you have, for example, two thousand pounds worth of flat fee, that's that's literally ten percent of that fund is going out as a flat fee each year. Um, now. I, I would suggest that maybe the fund needs to be a little bit bigger for for that um, balance, that cost benefit analysis to 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 really sort of pan out in the favour of the of the client. So I, in that particular instance, I'd say perhaps not, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't invest in in the likes of crowd property. I just I just don't think that um, the the analysis really sort of works too much there. I think a SIP or a, a personal pension for you know for a period of time build the fund to to a slightly higher level and then have um, have a a a, a relook at SAS at that time. Just to build off of that, what kind of level would you expect to someone if someone is thinking about it and they are looking to build their wealth and they're thinking right in the next five to ten years when for them or well, obviously for them it's different but. For each person but at what point should someone start thinking okay a sash is now a sensible time is it a specific level of wealth is it an age or how okay. when should someone think about setting that up okay so um i think the the key here is is to remember there is a, a an investment choice universe uh property is very much the the subject of today um and to to use a saas in property projects you've got to have a meaningful amount of money that you can deploy into that project whether by loaning to um to the company whether loaning to uh, another party who's uh, excuse excuse me one second It's a really good question, Todd. <laughs> Apologies. So, uh, in an open plan office here. Um, so, when, with property projects, um, you know you have to deploy a useful amount of money. Um, and if you're lending to your company, bearing in mind that one of the uh, the HMRC rules is that you can't lend back to your company more than fifty percent of the fund. You you know you're down to about fifty thousand um, pounds. You know with a with a hundred thousand pound fund. So it's got to be a meaningful level. Um, but in in this universe, you um, you know you have a lot of different choices. Um, some of my clients invest in crypto. Uh, some of them write uh, you know options. Some of them are in foreign exchange. Uh, some of them are into um, uh, private equity. Uh, some of these investments are making two, three, four, five percent per month. Um, and with the you know a sort of reasonable degree of certainty, they they're getting those returns. Um, so the amount of money that you need in a particular investment that they, you know, these are experts in their field, the amount of money that you have in, in those sorts of investments to make it worthwhile, to overcome that hurdle of those charges, um, isn't, isn't a huge amount. So I think, I, I'm, unfortunately, I'm going to sound a bit like a politician. It depends um, on what you're going to do with the money um, to, to, um, to answer that question usually with property clients um where we are in the region of, sort of you know 200,000 there or thereabouts will will be a sort of a meaningful amount um that would that would allow them to do projects but uh, as i say it all depends on what you're going to do with it um if if people are interested um we we have a sort of free service where people can uh, sort of pop into a, a zoom each week 
um, and uh, and and pose those questions, uh, learn a bit more about SASs and the sort of the the detail of it, uh, if that's of any help. Cool. Okay. Great stuff. Um, so um, another question here is. Can a sole business owner have a SaaS just for themselves initially? So, that's uh, sure, sure answer. Yeah, yes, uh, it can be one person plus. Um, as I say, up to that um, maximum of eleven. Um, yeah, so one person a company can do that. And do you have to be a director of a limited company to have a SaaS? Um. You don't have to be a director, but it's usually for director owners. So if you if you own the company and you're you're you know you're driving the the direction, if you're directing the the business, then you know you are more likely to be at sort of that position of authority where um, you can uh, you, you can make those decisions on you know what contribution levels um, you you want to pay yourself. Um, and also, would you lend to a company? Would you use your pension to lend to a company that you weren't a director of? It's going to use that money for something. You do want to be in control of of that process as well. I, I would suggest you should be a director. Okay. Um, there's two other sort of questions here. I'll do the first one, Todd, and you can do the second one. So the first one, I'm unclear why SaaS providers charge a fee. Uh, I thought from an earlier slide there was no such things as SaaS provider since you provide it yourself so that's probably a really good question just around wh wh yep. where the fees are generated from and, and, okay. and how that structure works uh, if i've if i've um if i've sort of confused the uh, the terminology here a provider is um someone who has gone to hmrc and has um has already structured a a, a product and are selling that product so um, a provider would be legal in general uh, or standard life, that sort of thing. Uh, in this particular case, as I say, you're going directly to HMRC. Um, and at that stage, you do need a scheme administrator. Now, you can be the scheme administrator, which means you are taking the responsibility to be um, the expert in that field and to comply with HMRC's rules. Um, and, and in that situation, um, you obviously wouldn't charge yourself anything and there we go. You have your 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 free SaaS, as it were. If you want to use a company like Empowered, um, you're, if, it's a little bit like having an accountant or a, a cross between an accountant, a solicitor, and an operations, uh, you know, it's like a administrator that you know, does the paperwork and all those sorts of things. So we do um, bank reconciliations, we do the accounting, we submit the records to HMRC in the same way that your accountant would do. Um, and uh, if there are any questions that HMRC have, then we answer those questions. We deal with your investments and, and make sure that uh, that they are um, uh, correctly recorded, correctly accounted for, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, ours is a service provision. We charge for that service provision. If you want to do it yourself, uh, that is that is completely up to you. You are allowed to. Uh, you just have to make application to HMRC and say that you're a fit and proper person and you understand the responsibilities that you have. And, and hey, presto, you can do it yourself. Brilliant. Okay, Todd, any other ones there? So we've got, can I mop up my partner's old pensions and transfer them into my SAS <laughs> pension with her as a new trustee member? Uh, but short answer, yes. Um, you know, you can transfer in pre-existing pensions from, uh, from you know, past work lives. Um, so if you or your fellow members um, of your SAS um, have uh, pre-existing pensions, yes, you can pull those all in. Sometimes you require financial advice. Sometimes you don't. Um, you know, it's a... Uh, no, nobody would ever want to do anything um, where they they didn't have full understanding of the facts and the uh, the responsibilities and and potential losses of of benefits. You know, there's a it's it was, some of these pensions have very significant um, uh, guarantees and and sort of uh, uh, options in them. Uh, you wouldn't want to lose those without understanding that. So, sort of financial advice is very often uh, uh, you know a, a good idea. Um, and in some cases is an obligation. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so before we do any other um, questions, we'll, we'll see how time goes to, to do any of those sort of technical ones, but what I do want to do, um, Lars, in the time we'll have and for the left, so next sort of seven, ten minutes-ish, um, SaaS pensions and property, and it's something that we have 
discussed mm-hmm. over coffee um, off and on over probably about a year and a half, two years. Um, so there is a source of funding that can be accessed by property developers, which is you know, SaaS pensions who are able to lend out 50% to their own company or invest in the right type of property. So maybe define what type of property can a SaaS pension invest in and what is your thoughts around that being what I call an alternative source of funding. So a developer who wants to raise money, happy to give a first charge. You know, wh- wh- where does the SaaS come in there as a solution? Okay, so let's uh, let's start with uh, what the SaaS can and can't invest in. Um, it can invest in commercial property. It cannot invest directly in residential property that is fit for human habitation that a normal family would live in. There are certain residentials that it can hold, and they tend to be care for. So uh, care for the young, be a children's home, care for the elderly, time at home, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So if there's care for, um, so supported living, um, you, you, th- you, you can actually have a residential house, which is leased to a, a care provider, um, you know, that looks after people who have mental health issues or sort of substance abuse issues. And so that, that is something that you can hold directly or indirectly um, as an asset of the pension scheme. Um, you can't hold a normal house, normal, um, you know, family living in that, uh, that house. Unfortunately, uh, you can't have um, that as an asset of your pension scheme. You can lend to someone um, who is going to develop um, residential property. So again, um, it's, a, it's a source of funding. Um, you can group together with other lenders and create a larger loan um, to, um, to, to lend and, and gain a first charge in that. Um, uh, you can invest in uh, things uh, which qualify for one of the, I mean, it sounds very much a sort of jargony thing, but there are, there are certain rules that HMRC have, um, and one of those is a uh, what they call a genuinely diverse commercial vehicle, which is a trading concern. Um, it essentially some something that you know buys a raw product, goes through a process, and then sells that product. Um, you know, in that sort of scenario where um, you are uh, investing in that operation, then yes, you can hold something. It may very well be that that source material is is a residential property so some points but you know buying it developing it into something and selling it that is a trade um and yeah you can you can invest in that sort of thing so and this is this is where the scheme administrator and the corporate trustees sort of come into their own so very often we have clients and high percentage of our clients are into property they come to me with a with an idea of what they want to do we discuss um you know that idea um if it can be done easily um, you know, it's uh, fairly straightforward. And sometimes, um, you know, it needs to be sort of worked on a little bit to sort of structure the right deal um, for it to uh, to be acceptable as an investment for a SaaS. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit um, problematic if you just simply want to buy a yeah, ordinary terraced house, you want to develop it and, and keep it. That is, that is a problem for a SaaS. Um, lending, not so much a problem. Lending to yourself to do that, not so much a problem. Um, o- owning a supported living, a sort of a house of care, that sort of thing, that is that's fairly straightforward. Uh, owning commercial property, that's fairly straightforward. Um, even property you're going to convert from commercial to residential, yeah, so bad. It becomes a problem when it becomes residential property, but um, you know that's what your scheme administrator is supposed to be helping you with. Mm-hmm. Is it fair to say then, just to really drill down on that, as long as before the property becomes habitable, before it becomes, if you like, you know, fully residential, as long as the SAS is exited before that point, then at any stage before that point, it 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 should be or most likely will be um SAS applicable. I, I think you I think the better way of putting it is you're you're right, but I rather than it should, I would say it can be. Um, so, for example, you know, uh, if you if you look at commercial property, yes, you can um, take a commercial building, you can get change of use. Then there's an uplift in the value as you've got that permission to change it to residential property. Um, then, then you have that sort of decision: What do I do with this thing? Do I actually want to use my pen, all of my pension fund to to convert this thing? 
uh, knowing that um, I've got to get rid of it at a certain point in time before it's actually legally completed. Now, if it's not legally completed, how are you going to sell it on to someone? Mm -hmm. Good question. But you could actually, once you've got that change of use, you could sell it to your own company because it's still residential property. To be fair, you've not put any breeze blocks down. You've not done anything with it, but you've got an uplift in the value. You just happen to have used your pension fund in order to acquire it in the first place and get that change of use. So you've made money. You haven't had to go to the bank. You haven't had to, to do a lot of things. So you've got that opportunity there. You then sell it to your, um, to your company using all the funding options that are that are available at that stage you've made money and you can sell it on it's a sort of like a land banking thing for the for the small developer smaller developer mm, yeah okay so no, cho thank choices you. that's the that's the main thing yeah yeah okay no th th thank you for that so would would you agree with me if we're taking a holistic look or a bird's eye view should i say of the the uk market the amount of money i don't know what the figure is maybe you know roughly what 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 does the SaaS pension market represent in terms of a figure? Uh, I guess it's minuscule. quite high. <laughs> no, it's minuscule. In terms of, okay. um, yes, yeah, SaaS, SaaS is, a, you know, they've been around since the 70s. Um, but uh, in terms of the um, the actual penetration, the, the number of SaaS is out, there's very, very few. Um, it, it, it is mainly because, um, you know, SIPs and personal pension are that much more popular for the sort of the general person in the street. Look, SAS is not a passive thing. It's not, it, you can't just, you know, sort of flop your way into it. You've got to have a plan. You've got to have um, a, a, as we've talked about, we've got to have, um, a, a, you know, a fairly sizable fund for it to be useful to you. Um, it is like, it is literally like starting your own investment bank. Um, there are rules around it, but if you comply with those rules, you can do a lot of things that you can't do. You just can't do them in a SIP or a personal pension. Now, that will appeal to some people, and it won't appeal to others. Um, but uh, say so the, the the number of SaaS is relatively few, sort of less less than a hundred thousand in the in the country. And if you compare that to the millions of personal pensions, uh, it's as I say, it's a very sm small part of the, uh, the the environment. Okay, so that figure of a roughly a hundred thousand, what would that be in terms of pot size? I'm, I'm thinking of a developer looking at this as a source of funding is there plenty of SaaS funds out there looking for a home and property is what i'm sort of trying uh, to get at uh i mean there's there's a lot of money uh, i mean we look after a lot of money um i mean we we have 400 million or, or so in uh in, in sort of you know direct assets and probably the same amount in indirect assets uh we we're usually sort of sitting on 30 to 50 million pounds worth of cash um, do we do we find it easy to you know you know put these loans together? Do you know it's it's yeah it's it's you know there's a fair amount of money. If you if you took the sort of the the accepted average um, SaaS size, which is around about three hundred thousand, hundred thousand SaaS, so it was thirty. Uh, I can't. Like, there's there's a lot of zeros in there, so it's a it's a fairly sizable amount of money. Um, but it's it. It's more about what you can do with your SaaS um, that's you know useful to you. Um, that's the, that's the key here. Uh, yeah. I, I wouldn't suggest getting into this so that you can access other people's SaaSes. Um, that that's not the, the the way to think about it. Think about what it can do for you rather than what you can uh, access yeah. through to others. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. Um, in terms of um, most SaaS lending, I guess is on a first charge basis if it goes into property. What's your opinion on? second charge for for SaaS lending is that something that that's, uh, that's a that's a it's a great question um in uh, and I, I i'll answer it as 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 best i can because it's you know i i don't make the decisions it's clients that make the decisions um if we go back to the the the, the genesis of uh, of empowers back in 2015 2016 um you know all the way through to pretty much 2020 uh you you couldn't help but you know make money in in property if you knew what you were doing so you you know if you lent somebody some some money uh, on a on a non first charge on a sort of secondary charge mezzanine basis um, you know, as as long as they did their job and as long as they've sold it or refinanced it, everything worked uh, just fine. But unfortunately, you know, we are there are there are cycles in property, and um, you know, as you know, twenty twenty turned into the in the year that it was. 
um, you know, things didn't go the same way. There was, you know, sort of uh, sort of materials and there was difficulty in funding. And, and, and you know, as a consequence of that, a consequence of that, um, you know, projects didn't work out quite as well, in some cases, catastrophically wrong. So if you're lending on a second charge or worse basis, sometimes even no security whatsoever, um, and uh, your the the borrower doesn't pay the money back. They'll pay the, the they'll pay the senior debt back, but if because they've got the first charge. But if there's no money left over for you afterwards, and and that happens to be the you know sort of big percentage of your pension, you're going to lose it. It's gone, and you made that decision. So can you do it? Yes. Should you do it? Probably no. You know. Just because you have the power doesn't mean you have to exercise. This is what I say. The the best projects are, or well, the best um, SaaS stories are, are where people do things with security and understanding of of what they're doing. Um, where you don't have that security, it, you know, it can go catastrophically wrong. I mean, zero return type things. Not even not even as investment return, zero return of capital. So, I would say, I I wouldn't. But it's not my yeah. money. Yeah. Okay. No, I think that's very that's very fair. Okay. Just watching the clock here, Todd. I think there's a few more questions in there from from attendees, which are all um, very relevant because even people listening to the recording are probably going to have similar questions. So, um, you want to do the next next couple? Yeah. So, how long does it take to get your money out of a SaaS to buy a commercial property? It sounds long. In which case, you might lose the deal. How can you be SaaS ready to buy? Well, a, a SaaS buying commercial property is no more complex than a company buying commercial property. So if you um, if you have your heads of terms signed and you have your solicitor appointed, uh, we can fund the, the deposit pretty much that day. Once it's you know, once you're there, you're there. If you've got the money in the in the SAS at that stage, it is just a, a matter of of uh, you know doing the legal process and, uh, and and getting it over the line that way, so that that is not going to take a long time at all. Uh, getting a SaaS set up roughly eight to twelve weeks um, in the in the process with HMRC, so about sort of three months ish. But then you've got to get your money into it, and and that means you've got to either transfer it in from somewhere else, a pre existing pension, or you've got to make contributions, and and that's the that's the process that could take a, a while. But this is a, a a product that could last for 125 years. Your pension scheme is multi generational. You hand it on to the next generation. Is is six months or nine months or even a year? Um, you know, sort of too much to ask if you're if you're making that sort of um, structure. Cool, good answer. And we have one which is my partner only has 29k to transfer into the SAS, would there be a fee to do that? Uh, I think we charge, I mean, we we charge, I think, £150 or £200 to do that process. Um, I I would have to say that, you know, it goes goes back to the earlier question about, you know, you know how much is, is it worthwhile doing a SAS with? Um, I think you have to look at the SaaS provider and say, look, you know, what is the basis of their charging structure? Some have got a flat fee. You can have like two, three, four um, people in the in the scheme for that flat fee. Some will charge a, a, a fee for the first and second one and, and so on and so forth. So if you've got a, a, a fee per member um, and you, and the second member's not bringing in a great deal of, of money, you have you have to look at it and go, is is it you know value for money? I think, they, and that that comes down to having a sort of frank, on, an honest conversation with whoever you're going to set your SaaS up with. Um, I, I think you know, interviewing them is the is the key thing. Have have your plan first off, and then you know, sitting sitting down with that administrator or sort of having this sort of conversation with them, saying, look, you know, this is the plan. How can you help me a- achieve that? Some will say we're not going to. It's not our job to do that. Some will say, well. This is this is how we're going to help you, and and then you make your decision based on that. I think. Cool. We've got. Is it possible to hold a SaaS in the UK slash a UK limited company? But a UK limited company director, if is not a resident of uh, like in the UK, so can you open one if you're basically you know you're you're a director? I think, but you have your limited company. You're a director, but you're not in the UK. You're not a UK resident. 
Um, well, I, I guess in that, I mean, it's, that's a difficult question to answer, um, it, uh, you know, across the piece because there's a number of different sort of uh, scenarios that could have sort of could occur there. Um, you usually you would expect the person to be resident in the UK for tax. Um, the uh, I, I think that's probably the best answer. If they're resident in the UK for tax, and the answer is probably yes. Um, so. Uh, if they're not resident in the UK for tax, it's going to be problematic. Yeah, no, no, knowing the the person that asked that question, it's probably a little bit to do with the quirk of um, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and the UK. Um, so, uh, that, well, the, that, there's, uh, there's nothing nothing wrong with the uh, with Northern Ireland at all. We're perfectly happy. With their yeah, but it's to do with maybe a resident. They might you, you might be living here, um, or but not actually being a UK director of a limited company. You know, so there could be just a quirk ar around that. Uh, um, maybe more uh, maybe an email, an email question. Answer yeah, I think around that one. Very, very, very happy to answer that offline. Uh, as I say, we we've got this sort of weekly thing, so it's it's something that people can pop into and, and pose those questions. Yeah. Okay. So conscious of time here. Um, I think if we go for like very brief sort of um half sentence answers for the rest okay. of these. Uh, Apologies. Do you have a company to have us? I think that's more or less the same same question there. Do you have yeah. to be a director of a limited company to have a SaaS? You've, you've answered uh, that. Um, answer yes. As long as, as, long as mm -hmm. you take your money out, that's fine. Um, are you allowed to join first charge SaaS lending for Empower members and say with other non-empowered SaaS trustee schemes jointly? I think that is what that means. So are you allowed to join first charge SaaS lending for Empowered members and I think that means stay with other non-empowered SaaS trustee schemes jointly. Yeah, so can you invest uh, with a separate company, so a separate scheme, uh, like jointly on first charge lending? Um, we, we certainly have um, situations where we have created group loans where there are empowered clients and non-empowered clients uh, non non empowered SASs. So the answer the answer to that is yes. In the same way that you know we can create a a, a group loan which also includes companies. So for example, some people might have um, uh, corporate money that they want to lend. So answer is yes. We don't mind um, syndicating. Brilliant. Okay. Um, we are going to have to um, move on, even though it's, it'd be great to keep taking loads more questions on on that stuff. Um, but I think that's been really beneficial. I had. Haven't even got to about six of the questions I had for you today, Lars. <laughs> um, Sorry about but, that. But in some way, that's actually better because the attendees have led the question, which is perfect. So um, they, they've got a lot of questions answered. But certainly, uh, I think there's a lot to unpack around what I think is, is the potential. I'll give you the, the last word on this. I think there are developers out there who have potential investor clients interested in investing in their deals who mm -hmm. could do it via their SaaS's. And, and therefore, I think there's an opportunity that a lot of developers don't even think about in terms of when they go out looking for funding. And I think there is a huge opportunity. You can either say I'm, I'm over optimistic or agree with me, but I think there's an opportunity for for funding to be sourced, maybe first charge from from SaaS pensions. Short short answer, yes. Um, but, but as I said, the, the devil is always in the detail, and and we're we're very happy to work with people, um, who you know pose the what if question. So yes, yeah, brilliant. Okay, so um, really appreciate that. What I'm going to do is um, just a big shout out. Um, you should, for those who've read our funding focus this week that came out um, yesterday, uh, we've mentioned this. I've added two links into the chat box um, on this. Um, webinar now. Um, one are the details of this event and the second one is um, the discount code if you're a prop funders uh, member of our community. So this is a, a big event that's happening uh, next week. You can again comment on this Lars and in fact I'll let you, you go first um, in terms of what is this event, uh, who are the main speakers and then I'll explain the, the discount to prop funders community members. Um, well the the 
the objective um, of of Empowered Group is is a sort of holistic approach to to wealth creation. Um, yes, we're very pen pension centric, but it's uh, in order to have a SaaS, you have to have a business. So uh, this particular event is our first biannual conference, and it's uh, it's looking at um, sort of the needs of business owners. We have a a selection of uh, of uh, of you know sort of very high uh, performing, high you know high value um, uh, entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, it's it is there so that people can so like, pick their brains and, and listen to the, the the stories that they have. Uh, unfortunately, you, you've you've got me uh, again um, on on one of as one of the speakers. But um, it's it for for us it's it's a first um, and and hopefully it's the one the first of many um, and uh, is in the sort of the, the very prestigious sort of Lansdowne Club uh, in Mayfair. No problem. Obviously, Simon Zucci is one of your your keynotes on on the day. Yeah. Um, uh, si yep, Simon's in there. Uh, Mathieu's in there. Um, Amy. Yep. Uh, it's a, um, they're they're all good quality, and you don't normally see um, these folk on the on the speaking circuit. So, uh, very very happy to to see people there. Yeah, brilliant. So, um, as part of the relationship uh, that I've had with Lars over the, over the years, um, and working with some members of his his team. And obviously what we're trying to do with, with prop funders, um, Lars has kindly allowed a discount uh, for anyone who's connected to prop funders in our community. Um, so it's quite a substantial uh, discount off the, the um, full rate card price, if you like. So I've mm -hmm. dropped that information that's in the chat or reach out to, to Brenda by email uh, and we'll gladly send you that link. Um, I'm flights booked, looking forward to coming over. Uh, I'm visiting a couple of, of sites uh, on the Wednesday, doing some podcasts, uh, recording on the Thursday, of which Lars is one of them. Um, and then um, looking forward to attending this event on, on the Friday. Um, as you say, Lars, some of these speakers don't, don't normally um, go to these type of events. Um, and it's going to be, I think, also just the people in the room. There's going to be a lot of conversations right around the event uh, before and after and during. Uh, that I think is going to be some fantastic networking. So, so I certainly encourage anyone who is thinking about the world of SaaS, um, wanting to understand where SaaS fits into wealth creation and, and growth, uh, or a developer just trying to understand better this source of funding, I would really encourage you to, 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 to get here uh, to this event next week, and it would be great um, to see you uh, in the flesh as well. Um, so um, anything else you want to say on that, Lars, before we wrap up? No, I just uh, other than thank you very much for having me on. Um, it's it's uh, I've known you now for a, a, a few years now, and I've always been um, very very impressed by the 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 service you provide. So I'm happy to to help and support in the future. Um, and um, if you if you have any sort of further need for for SaaS information, I'd be very happy to give it. Fantastic! I think this could be a, a more regular event in terms of SaaS update uh, on our community webinar. But listen, I really appreciate you taking the time to come. We've literally got just two or three slides to, to finish off. If you do have any last minute words of wisdom, I'll give you give you 10 seconds at the end. But uh, yeah, for those that, that are, are familiar with what we operate, uh, our property funding podcast um, has been really successful the last number of months. Uh, we've got a number of really good speakers, um, all different types, different backgrounds, different involvements in property. Um, and uh, I certainly encourage you to have a look at the my, my own lawyer for the last 18 years, um, has, has got a really interesting take on the market. Um, he was uh, chairman of the Landlord Association uh, for a while, um, but the, the title of the property solicitor that can't go broke um, has certainly attracted uh, some views to that, um, but a really interesting journey and, and a whole bunch of others, others there as well. Uh, and soon you'll be able to hear uh, Lars's full story as well. Um, so go on, have a look at our, our property funding podcast. Uh, again, for any developers on here trying to understand better what Prop Funders does, you can go on to propfunders.com forward slash welcome um, and you'll see some information there about six steps to raising funds legally, a short intro video. You then can book a call with me um, to discuss a project that you have. And uh, if you want to leave details on your project, um, there's a, a place to do that as well. Um, we even offer a really cool service where you can put your details in to one of our, our homepages and then literally test the market through Brickflow and see what lenders would be willing to lend uh, on, on what terms uh, to, to your project. So it's a great way of just testing what is the appetite in terms of first charge lending there. Uh, for those that want to then, um, there is a chance to engage 
uh, our services regarding a preparation funding pack. That's where we simply help you, the developer, get ready for funding, be that equity or, or debt. Uh, we help prepare an offer document, uh, uh, a DD pack, uh, and really just get you ready uh, to engage with uh, a lender stroke equity investor. And uh, for those that would like more of a hands-on service over three months, um, they, we have the ultimate funding pack, uh, and that's where we become a member of your team and uh, literally do an hour a week for three months uh, and can bring all our experience to to your uh, your team as you do a project. So um, service one is like giving you a fish and preparing a funding pack for you. Service two is teaching you to fish. Uh, and once you've done that, then you'll be in a position to uh, go on in the future and secure your funds. So next webinar is Wednesday, the 20th of November, uh, again at 1 p.m., uh, this recording will be um, on our YouTube channel within about half an hour. Uh, and again, we'll email out to all the attendees uh, a copy of the recording. So with that, I think we are done. Any last minute words of wisdom or uh, pearls of wisdom from Lars? <laughs> Uh, it's very kind. Uh, all, all, all I would say is that if, if folk want to, to learn more, um, please reach out to me um, via LinkedIn um, and we'll connect you with the, with the team that do this sort of weekly um, uh, SaaS Q&A. So uh, thank you very much for having me on, David. No problem at all. Todd, anything I've missed or forgot about? or I think that is everything. No problem at all. Okay, well, thanks everyone for, for, for joining. I've just noticed that... Uh, this is a new a new version of, of Zoom, but I've managed to identify the end button. So thanks everyone for joining. You can catch the recording. And again, thanks to Lars and Todd. Stay safe, everyone. Till next month. All the best. Good luck. Thanks yeah, very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.